Sometimes the best stories in golf aren't found on tour. You'll find them at the back of the range. And here's your host, Ben Adelberg. And thank you again for joining me here at the Back of the Range Golf Podcast. I am your host, Ben Adelberg. This is episode 52. Before we get started with the final episode of season one, I hope everyone has enjoyed listening to all of the great stories that we have introduced you to this year. It's been a lot of fun for me, and I hope to continue to bring you weekly episodes in 2019 and beyond. If you've missed an episode throughout the year, don't worry. They're all available in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you listen to podcasts, you'll find us. And all of the information about the Back of the Range can be found at the website, thebackoftherange.com. I know I say it often, but please take a moment, leave a review in Apple Podcasts. Believe me, it's very important to us to know what you like and what you don't like about the Back of the Range. Do you want to hear more stories from the pros, amateurs, college coaches? Your feedback is welcome, so please let us know what you think about the podcast. You know that we're on Instagram, at the Back of the Range Podcast. We're on Facebook. We're on Twitter. All those links are in the show notes of each and every episode. We're going to start giving away more towels next year. We're going to start asking for more listener participation. Heck, we're probably going to do a listener golf trip in 2019. So stay tuned for that. Follow us on all of our social media channels. Finally, before we get into this week's episode, special thanks to Mitch Phillips. He is still the voice of the podcast. He gets us started on each and every episode. So to learn more about all the places you can listen to Mitch doing his amazing voiceover work, check out mpvoice.com. So our guest this week just spent a few days here in South Florida, actually, participating in the 2019 Walker Cup practice sessions. Many of the top amateurs in the country are here to get to know each other, hit a few shots in front of Captain Nathaniel Crosby, and do a little team building before the final team is selected next year to represent the USA at Royal Liverpool in September. Why was this week's guest invited to participate? Well, after winning the 2016 U.S. Mid-Amateur, Stuart Hagestad was a member of the 2017 Walker Cup team that was victorious at L.A. Country Club. Did I mention that L.A. Country Club is his home course? Well, it is. Stuart and I had a great conversation about his days at USC, his victory at the U.S. Mid-Am, his made cut at the 2017 Masters, and yes, we even got into that popular question of why he decided to stay an amateur and how that decision ultimately was the right one for him. So I'm thrilled to welcome the 2016 U.S. Mid-Am champ, Stuart Hagestad, to the back of the range. Stuart, welcome. Oh, thanks for having me. Well, uh, you have you've done this quite a few times before. You have done the the golf podcast realm. You have uh, accomplished quite a lot in amateur golf in in your short time playing. Um, but we're gonna kind of go in a different direction. Let's get a few like things out of the way here. You played college golf at USC, and I remember watching i believe it was like an espn 30 for 30 about the usc football team that had you know liner and reggie bush and uh, Pete carroll was the coach and i remember they they showed all these celebrities just swinging by the sidelines so you played college golf at usc what was your experience like uh, in college at usc you know it's tough enough to get my dad to come out and watch me play golf let alone any celebrities <laughs> but uh you know, it was, it was awesome. I mean, USC was my dream school. My dad went to USC. Um, my mom went to Stanford. And as I've joked about with Conrad before, I, um, I, I realized pretty quickly I, I probably wasn't going to go to, to Stanford. But um, Grades are no, important I, there. Grades are important there. Grades are important there, yeah. Um, luckily, my mom went two for four. Um, you know, I, I think I lost out on favorite child there, but that's okay. <laughs> nice. Um, you, can't, you can't win them all. But, uh, yeah. So like my middle school days were like the Pete Carroll era. Right. So like, you know, SC football was kind of running and gunning. Um, like, so I was on, I was on campus. I was taking a recruiting visit to SC with my mom and dad. And like, I knew exactly where I wanted to go. Like, I mean, you know, SC is an amazing school. I grew up in Southern California. Sure. All my best friends went to SC. I mean, not only, you know, did I kind of grow up going to football games, but if anyone's ever been to Southern California, like, you know, if we don't have the, the, the most, I'll say most beautiful for, for, you know, instead of hottest, but you know, if, if we don't have the best looking girls in the country, I'd love to know where they are. 
Um, I mean, like it was, it was my dream school. Like all my best friends went there. It was incredible. But so I'm on campus, um, and I'm with my parents and we're kind of going through the weight room, uh, with coach Zambri. And there's this guy in a Patriots hoodie kind of in the corner working out. And, you know, I'm kind of just not star studded because I've been on campus a bunch of times, but you know, I'm kind of looking around and, you know, Clay Matthews names on the wall and, you know, Leonard Bush and Lindale white and, it's like, you know, just peak SC. Sure. And I see this guy over in the corner and my dad's like, you know what that is, right? And I'm like, oh yeah, I know exactly who that is. And I, I didn't really want to bother him. And, um, you know, so coach and I, and my mom all kind of, we could walk out of the weight room. My dad being kind of cavalier walks over to, you know, this guy who's working out. And next thing I know, you know, there's this guy running, you know, in a Patriots hoodie up the, up the staircase. And he's like, Hey, 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 are you Stuart? I'm like, yeah. He's like, hi, I'm coach Carol. I'm like, yeah, man, I know exactly who you are. <laughs> He's like, you got to come to SC. This is the greatest school in the world. You know, my son goes here. He loves it. Your dad went here. I don't know why you'd even consider going anywhere else. This is the greatest school in the world. This is what you want to be a part of. And I'm just like, yeah, man, like I was fired up before, but good Lord. Like, yeah. I, I just like, I, he just had like such an infectious energy and vibe. And it was just like, yeah. So it's, um, no, I'm I'm very lucky to, to say that I went to my dream school. Well, and you know, you you mentioned your parents. You mentioned that you uh, you have siblings. And before we started recording this episode, you kindly shared some information. And I, I you know, we can get into as much detail as you want, but I guess the real, you know, the conclusion that that I've come to come to realize is, compared to your brothers and your sister, you're just not you're kind of an average athlete i mean you want sure you won the u.s mid and you played in that augusta tournament thing and um uh, but you're kind of average so share before i start insulting you right away but you know and, and let people in on the on the the news here about tell me about your brothers and your sister and and what they're up to right now while you're playing that golf thing yeah no i mean i i I've had a, I've had a nice run, you know, since, <laughs> nice since school. Run. <laughs> nice run. That's great. Go ahead. Sorry. But, but yeah, like, you know, I, I, I was the, I was the first child and, um, you know, I was fortunate to grow up in a, in a pretty competitive, you know, part of the country, um, in Orange County. And my mom went to Stanford. My dad went to USC. Um, I played, you know, golf at SC and I was in the business school and I, I, I pledged my freshman fall and I was a, kind of a brutal freshman first semester, but you know, it was, it was great. And, you know, I thought I, I, I'd come out and, you know, went to work in New York and in private equity. And, um, obviously, you know, as we said, you know, I had a nice run since school, but yeah. my, my, my sister went to Stanford. She was a computer science major. She got her master's from there as well. She works in Uber's self-driving cars unit. Her boyfriend made the Forbes 30 under 30 list at 23 and he's on his second company. He already sold his first. My, my brother is at USC. He's an accounting major. I think he's got like a three A. He's, um, you know, he's going to probably work in New York uh, next summer. You know, before going to work back there after graduation. And then my youngest brother um, is playing at Stanford on the water polo team, and I think they're ranked number one in the country. But yes, yeah, so like I come home to think, you know, for Thanksgiving and. You know, it's kind of like, you know, George, how's, how's the number one team in the country? Rich, you know, how's, you know, how's, how's school, you know, what, what, what high level investment bank are you going to work at, you know, next year? Lee, you know, how's, how's the self-driving cars unit? Stu, you, you still hitting balls? That's, that's cool. <laughs> For you. That's great. You know? Yeah. That's great. Yeah. How that's, you hitting it? Yeah. How you hitting it? Well, I got this new fade I'm working on. It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Wow. Well, uh, it sounds like uh, it sounds like you and the entire uh, the entire Hagestad clan are uh, are destined for great things, and uh, and I got a podcast, so all's right in the world. So, uh, <laughs> no, we're we're very lucky. Mom set the stand. Mom and dad set the standard high. So you know, you mentioned this great run of of twenty sixteen, lost with the U.S. Mid Am victory that gets you to the Masters is the fact that you win the the Met. Um, I, you know, I'm a native South Floridian. I'm not too aware of the competitive nature up there in the Northeast in the Met region, but there's so many good players that come out of there. Um, before we start asking about the, you know, the, the standard questions or the standard events of 2016 and 2017, how did the Met championship help you with that great run? Yeah, no, that's, that's a, it's a great, it's a great observation. I mean, I, I think that, you know, Florida, Texas, and and Southern California kind of get all the all the credit, you know, amongst the greatest kind of organizations in the country as far as production of players. But I mean, I'd argue that you know the Metropolitan Golf Association's right up there with it. I mean, 
it's hard. Like my, so my first year that I'm in New York, um, I'm, I'm working and I, for some stupid reason, you know, and then probably like the middle of February or something, I began to kind of get the golf itch, you know, cause you haven't touched a golf club in a couple months. And, um, you know, yeah. it's my first year out of school and I, you know, I haven't played in forever. And I went to their website and I was like, let's check out, you know, where just for kicks and giggles, where the, where the tournament schedule, you know, where they, where they're going to be this year. And the three biggest events in the Met section are this thing called the Ike, which is like their stroke play championship. Um, then there's the Met Amateur and then there's the Met Open. And the Ike was at Friar's Head. Uh, the Met Amateur was at Baltus Rawl, And the Met Open was at Wingfoot. And I'm just like, yeah, sign, we got to get involved. Sign me up for this one. Yeah. I mean, you know, let alone like a lot of my very close friends, you know, still in, in the area are some of the best players that are there and, you know, of years past as well. But I think, you know, like growing up in Southern California, I was very lucky. Like, you know, you, you play in the Southern California Amateur and you're playing against guys like, you know, Xander Schauffele and Bo Hostler and Max Homa and, you know, Michael Weaver and Patrick Cantlay. And I mean, you can go on and on. Sure. And I think what I was able to do when I moved back there was to kind of keep that same standard, um, you know, of, of playing against guys that were just such studs in their own right and kind of apply that, you know, to the Northeast that if I had played against these guys, you know, it's kind of like working on wall street out of college, like that job's going to travel anywhere. You know, I tried to take that experience and, you know, transfer it, you know, to, to, to my experience, you know, back East. And, um, you know, I think just, I, I had the opportunity to put the golf clubs away in the wintertime and to, to put on some weight. And um, I was fortunate enough to join a place called Golf and Body um, in the city. So while I, I didn't get to play during the wintertime, you know, every every now and then, especially kind of going into the summer, I, I got to hit balls, you know, with the use of a track man into a net. But, um, yeah, I, I, it, it helped in my development tremendously. And I, I think it was just a byproduct of, you know, um, some, some, some quality work in the off season and, you know, wanting to, to kind of stay involved with competitive golf. And, you know, it's amazing what a couple of good finishes will, will do for your confidence. So I think it was kind of a combination of all those things. Absolutely. Well, you, you play the U.S. Mid-Am. It's at Stonewall. Uh, you know, it's 2016. It's at Stonewall in Pennsylvania. Um, I had a, have a couple friends that did play in that tournament. And I got to talk about the tea gift most people are, are may, most people listening may not be aware that when you go play in these USGA events or actually any real good amateur event, they're, they're going to give you some. They're going to give you a hat or a shirt or. I'm looking at it right now. Oh, perfect. Okay, so yeah. you, you know you get a hat, you get a shirt. Beautiful. Yeah. So my friend, you know, I've I've seen the tea gift. I've, I've been over my buddy's house and and you know he's shown me this thing and he's like, yeah, look what we got. And I'm looking at him. I'm looking at this thing. Tell me about the tea gift you got at the 2016 US Mid Am. It's really interesting of all things you brought that up. Um, oh, there's much more useless information I'm going to bring up, Stu. So don't you worry. I got I got a good one for you pretty soon. Well, I mean, I we don't have many of these in in Orange County, California. <laughs> nice. Um, so I at first when I saw it, I was like, oh, it's a it's a opaque vase. That's interesting. Um, yeah, I don't. I, it's it's a milk jug, I think. Um, <laughs> it is. It's a milk jug. Yeah, because what it is, it's a yeah, milk jug, right? Yeah, because the cow is is the there's a cow for their logo. Yeah, it's it's like a very uh, it's a very rustic, interesting tea gift. It's a very interesting tea gift. Yes, yes. But but you know, I will say one thing. I really liked it. <laughs> I bet you did. It, it brings it brings back a lot of really good memories. Oh, of course, and of course you got the you got a you got a different jug at the end. You got a different tea gift than only one person gets, so it all works out good. Uh, That's right. <laughs> so yeah, you you play this. You, know, you win the U.S. Mid Am, and I looked at all the matches. You know, you you I think you finished in the stroke play thirty six hole portion about you know like t twelve something like that, and then you know most of your matches that you ran through, you had a couple two and ones, but then you had a couple you know four and twos, four and threes. But then you get to the final and you're playing against Scott Harvey. Scott Harvey. Hey, Michael, Michael, Michael McDermott had me three down through three. I had to, I had to, I had to come back and he's from Philadelphia and, you know, we were out there and we had a bunch of his friends and family that, you know, we've now, you know, become good friends, but don't, don't forget about Mike. Mike gets credit. He, he came to play that day. I met him and I was like, you know, who's this, who's this tall guy? And then I was three down through three and it was kind of like a shock to the system. I was kind of cruising until then. And I was like, Mr. Stu, you gotta, you gotta get back on your horse, bud. I think that's the funniest part of the episode so far that Stuart Haggis said says, who's this tall guy? What are you, 6'5", six, 6'6", six, six now? 
Yeah, but like he's like a lot more like you know like he's like tall and handsome. And I'm like tall and skinny. And oh, jeez, here we go with this shit. All right, all right, let's get back. <laughs> let's get back on the horse right now. All right, so you you, you get through McDermott and you get to Harvey. Harvey, another is, skinny guy. Another skinny guy. Man, this turned out to be like a like a fitness episode or something. Should uh, I should I play? I played Price too. I that's uh, do you know Andrew Price? I don't know Andrew Price. I'm a brick house compared to Price. Oh, okay. So uh, that that guy's eating too many salads and not enough steaks. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> no, 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 no. Andrew's Andrew's a stud. Um, he's from Chicago, and he's a really, really. If if I had known how good he was, um, you know, right out of the gate, um, you know, I I I, I probably wouldn't wouldn't have played as well as I did. So when you're playing that, that brings okay. That brings another question up. When you're playing, do you want to know exactly who these guys are that you're going up against? Are you googling and researching some of the guys you're you're facing, or do you just kind of like, yeah, I don't want to know. I'm just going to show up, tee it up, and just go. <laughs> I mean, I I think I kind of used to be that way. Like, what's his deal? I mean, I I think now I just don't really. It's not that I don't really care. It's just that. Um, doesn't make a difference. I mean, they could they could be, yeah, they could be now, world beaters, but it just depends on what they're doing that day and what you're doing that day. Yeah, like so, like when I was, you know, I oh gosh, when I was, I don't even know what year it was. I think it was going to like my senior year of college. I played in the California Amateur and I finished like third in stroke play, third or fourth, and I played. Excuse me, I played some kid I'd never heard of, and my dad flew up to see me because I was up at Monterey Peninsula, and I was, I think I turned at three up, and then I think I was three up through twelve. And I was like even par the last six and I lost two down. And my dad, I think caught me on like 16. He's like, Hey, how you playing? This is before, not before iPhones, but like before, like he knew how to like properly use an iPhone, like to, you know, check. <laughs> sure. And, um, yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I kind of had this like stunned look on my face. I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm even and I'm getting waxed. And, um, so like the point of that is like, no matter who you're playing, like anyone's capable of going out and shooting a really good number. So, you know, whoever it is, like whether they played on Saturdays and Sundays, you know, for checks or, you know, there's someone from your local association, like I guarantee, you know, if you don't already know who he is, like James Nicholas is the guy from the Met section. He plays at Yale. I think he's a senior. He was uh, Ivy League player of the year last year. And he's currently leading as far as like strict stroke average, you know, all of the NCAA, but sure. you wouldn't know who he is because he doesn't play in the quote unquote marquee events for college. So it's just like, listen, everyone's really good. You got to show up and not take anything for granted. I think anyone that's played at a high level for a long time or for any time, you know, could probably tell you the same. Yeah. And if you're in that tournament, they obviously you can play. Um, yeah, so, so for sure. yeah, so this this final match, you're you're against Harvey. He's he's won the tournament that you're trying to win. He's the 2014 champ, and and you know this this match you had is uh, you know famous for the fact that you know you're you're basically down. Um, I think you you know birdie four out of the last five holes to get it to um, you know to get it to extra holes. You win on the extra one. Uh, you know just to make this slew of birdies. You got to play in other stuff with Scott Harvey. You actually, you know, were on the other end of the stick when he got into a USAM and you were on the outside looking in. As a, you know, high level amateur, you're going to see Scott Harvey for several years to come. Yeah, he actually, we had the chance to play together at the Thomas a couple months before that, too. And um, we were tied. We played together in the third round and we were tied um, after three rounds. We went to a sudden death playoff, an aggregate three hole deal. And I had about an eight or 10 footer to win on the third hole and I missed. And then that went to extras and he beat me there too. So I was actually owing two going into that. <laughs> so you're going back and forth with this guy. Uh, does it the... was a pretty one-sided street at that point, but oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, you, you, you got, you righted the ship in a big way. Is that something you guys talk about at all? Do you ever talk about that with him or is it just a little too soon? I don't know how to answer that. Cause like if, if Scott, I don't know why, I'd, you know, it would ever be brought up, but I mean, we were friends and, you know, we played each other since like we had the chance to play each other in the first round of the crump earlier this year. And we've, um, we've played together, you know, a good bit before. And I mean, Scott's a stud, like yeah, he's played, I mean, he qualified for the U S open last year. He, I mean, you out, you know, his resume too. Um, you know, we've traveled a good bit together. I mean, I, I look up to Scott, you know, he just had his second child and, um, you know, a lot of, you know, things that he's done kind of the world of, of the game. And, um, you know, he, he did it before me. So like, if there's anything, 
you know, as far as what he's done that I can try and take and, and try and apply to my game or just the way that, you know, he's been, you know, a father and a husband and, you know, just kind of a, a voice of, of, you know, the world of, of not only mid amateur golf, but amateur golf as a whole. Um, you know, I, I, I have nothing but, you know, the highest level of respect for him. And if he wants to talk about it, I'm happy, but right, right. it's more, it's more just like, I enjoy, you know, kind of spending time with him, you know, because that's, you know, at a, you know, to a, to an extent kind of where I want to be, you know, in, in that years, in that same amount of time. And the same could be said for Nathan or any of those guys that's played at a high level. Sure. Well, you know, as everyone knows, the winner of the U S mid am gets the invite to play in the following year's masters, uh, in 2017, you know, you made the cut, you know, the, the first U S mid am qualifier to make the cut. I know, uh, Jay Sigel did make the cut, but it was because he got in as a Walker Cupper. So, you know, there's a lot of the there's a lot of run of the mill standard issue questions I could ask you about the Masters experience, but um, you know, actually, I totally forgot this one question. I need to ask you this one. <laughs> it's all good. So, um, so U.S. Mid Am champion, uh, you know, I could ask you questions about what was the key to your victory, and we could all talk about your ball striking and about uh, making putts. But you know, one of the keys to winning this tournament, and really any tournament, if you really come down to it, the first thing you got to do is you got to show up on time for your tee time. I mean, that's in any tournament. You got to get there on time. When they say your name, you got to have the ball ready. You got to be able to tee it up. We have researchers all over the country that have called in about this episode to give me a helping hand here. Can you think of any reason that you may have accidentally missed a tee time in the U.S. Mid-Am when you won? Is this a loaded question? I already know the answer. Did you need a ride to the golf course? Did something happen? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, I see where this is going. Uh Yeah. Um, Yeah, so, you know... Growing up in Los Angeles and we'll call it New York City, like, you know, the idea of there not being like a readily available Uber is like just completely outside the realm of possibility. First world problems. So, First world problems. I understand. It's yeah. Okay. Like, no, totally. Like, just, Stu, what are you doing? Um, right. Yeah. So I'm at the hotel and I'm like waiting for an Uber and, you know, I gave myself plenty of time to do it. Um, you know, like probably an hour 30 or 40 in advance of my tea time, but it's super early. It's probably like, you know, five forty five, six AM and like guys just like aren't awake in the middle of, of Pennsylvania, in Elverson, Pennsylvania. Yeah. And um, you know, I'm 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 sure I would have been fine whether it was like a cab or something, but like I'm just like a very anxious person by nature. Sure. And, like to the point where I'm like kind of like O C D about certain things. And I was beginning to kind of like low key freak out and panic. And um and, you know, thankfully by, you know, sheer luck or serendipity or whatever, um, you know, there was, there were a couple of guys that were, that were heading over. And I know they're South Florida guys and the name's escaping me and this shouldn't be. Um, and that's, that's where I put two and two together here. But, you know, I had the chance to kind of, to, to grab a ride, you know, to the course. Um, I think it was during stroke play. I think it was the first day. Yeah. Who yeah. was it? Who, who, who was it? Who ratted you out? That would be Mike Blum, who is on the board of the Palm Beach County Golf Association. And, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. So Mike Blum ratted you out. It well, didn't rat you out, but he, uh, actually, I played golf with a buddy of his, Jason Dollard, who, uh, listens to the podcast all the time. And he's yeah. like, Oh, oh, you're talking to Hagestad? You got it. You got it. You got to see if he remembers this. So, uh, Oh, that's amazing. I, I, I hadn't completely, but I know exactly. Okay. That's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. So that was just a random thing. And I was like, Oh, I gotta, I gotta just surprise you with that one. So at first, at first, at first I was like, shit, like, what did I, what like, did I do? Yeah. Like, like, I know there's a lot of bodies buried, but good Lord. Like what, oh. what did I do? Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, so that's a funny little story from that U.S. mid am but, uh, that's awesome. yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, um, so, so you win this, you know, the, the tournament ends basically mid September, you know, you're it's on the calendar for the following April to, uh, to play in, in the masters, you know, it's on the calendar. So from September to April, you just, you know, it's coming. And, you know, we have a lot of listeners that play casual games with friends or club championships one of the the problems of the, of the amateur golfer is maybe putting too much pressure, too much too much importance on one single event. 
So you get the invite to the Masters. You have several months before it's going to happen. I, I know what you did at the Masters, but how did you prepare to play in the Masters? I mean, the short answer is I prepared to win. I mean, that's not, I'm that guy that's going to listen to this and kind of, you know, not shake his head, but like, kind of just be like, really? Really? Like, yeah. Wrong yeah. Guy. yeah. Believe me, I'm that guy too. But like, the reality is, is like, you're two things. One, the golf ball doesn't know who you are. So we'll start there. Um, and two, like, if, if you're going just, you know, to, to, have, sight, a, to sight have a nice time. Yeah. yeah and like, like that's cool, but you're going to have a pretty forgettable week. Like, so like when I, there were like a couple stages, like when I was first invited and like it, it probably kicked in like a month later after I had, you know, kind of gotten back to people and settled back in at work and, you know, just a lot of, it, it like had kind of, you know, I'd had some time to kind of think about it when that kind of sunk in it, you know, I literally was like, Oh shit. Like, <laughs> yeah. You're yeah. Like, you know, you're, you're hitting that first tee shot. So you know, so, so that was that. And then I, you know, over time, you know, as I realized that I could still, you know, get it airborne and, you know, hit balls and practice and, you know, that was fine. And I made trips down there, um, you know, with, with a couple friends that are members as well as my own trips and, you know, did, did my homework and got ready for it. But about a week and a half before, um, I had like a full blown case of anxiety, like back home in, in Orange County, I was like, like, this is real. Like you're hitting balls next to guys that you idolize, you know, growing up Phil yeah. and, 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 you know, we'll say, you know, Dustin and Ernie Els and this is real. And so I texted, um, you know, Justin Thomas, who ironically was there at the time, who's, who's a good friend since junior golf. And I was like, dude, like, what do I do? And like, he literally like had to like talk me off a ledge. Um, and he was, if you remember that picture where like Tom Brady and, um, I think it was like Kevin Plank and Jimmy Don and, and, and Jordan were all down there. I think he was in that group as well. And he, at the time he was ironically there and he was just like, Stu, like, you're going to be fine. Like, you know, everyone here just, you know, we, we love to play golf and we're, and we're, and we're good at it. So like, you're in the same boat, like you're totally fine. So back to your original question of how did you prepare for it? Well, the preparation of, going into that, like you're going to prepare a lot differently if your mindset is, you know, Hey, we're going to go down there and we're going to see how we do versus no, like we're going to go down there. And if we have our best stuff, like, I think we can be there on Sunday afternoon. Right. Like it's a, it's just, it's just a mindset. Like it's the same thing in business. It's the same thing in, you know, in fitness, whether you're working out, it's the same thing in your, your, in any aspect of your life, you know, as a father, as a marriage, like if you think you're just going to, you know, going to coast in and, you know, see what happens, like, well, that's dumb like the mindset of, of preparing the right way goes into it far, far, far beyond that. So I really tried to kind of commit, you know, this is what our goal is. This is how we're going to prepare. Sure. This is the kind of practice that we're going to put in. And this is what's required to give yourself the opportunity, you know, to, to play your best. Um, so that's kind of, that's kind of, Oh, then the last thing is, so we're there. I'm, 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 I'm practicing at big Canyon probably like a month before, like three weeks before. And, you know, I've, I've been asked seemingly every day for like the last couple months, you know, at the time, you know, oh, are you getting ready? Have you been down there? How are you feeling? You know, and you, you've kind of, you know, gotten used to it and you've kind of, you yeah. know, got your stock answer. Right. And a friend, um, he, he's like, Hey Stu, how you doing? I'm like, I'm, you know, doing well. How about you? All good. Hey, what do you think your odds are of making the cut? Oh, I'm like, shit. it took every bit of me. I'm not going to like say what I actually, I'm not going to say what I thought, but I, you know, I'm sitting there and I'm like, bro, like, come on, man. Like, you know, we're like, that's just, that's not what you like. I, I, I probably gave some answer like, you know, I, you know, I hopefully, hopefully pretty high. Right. But right. <laughs> no, like what runs to your head is just like, come on, man. Like, Oh no, absolutely. Yeah. You, you have to go in there. I mean, it, not just forget about the Masters. You got to go into any event. I mean, you, you weren't going into the U.S. Mid. You weren't going into the Met thinking, well, you know, uh, ho hopefully I do fine. And did you do anything specifically different to prepare for that golf course than you did for other ones where, you know, the greens notoriously are running super quick, um, you know, very you mean like Yeah, like you mean like putting on a local Equinox basketball court or something? Um, 
<laughs> is that what you did, Stu? N- n- no. Okay. No. Um, <laughs> but no, I mean, like I... tight chipping areas. Um, you know, I'm just curious as someone that has played the Masters. It's the the golf course is is different than than quite a few other championship golf courses that maybe you've played on. Is there anything that you did differently, whether it's maybe equipment wise, whether it's um, you know anything like that that you did differently for that event than maybe you did for other ones? Yeah, um, you know, I, I had a new set of wedges in that week. Okay. But as far as equipment is concerned, not really. Um, I'm kind of a big believer in if it's not broken, don't fix it. Sure. And if not, you find something that's significantly better, don't change. Um, so, so not there. Okay. Um, you know, I, I don't know. I, I guess I put on a little bit of weight, but anyone that's seen me, you know, would tell you that that's not true. <laughs> okay. Um, no, I, like... I kind of did the same things more or less that I do typically. Um, I usually try and putt down grain downhill if I can downwind. Um, at, at, at the masters, um, at Augusta national, there's two speeds. There's, you know, kind of their everyday play speed and, and then there's what they call tournament speed. Um, and tournament speed is, is really quick. Like I'm, I'm sure you've played, you know, on, on greens where they kind of get that shade of purple, yep, um, yep, yep. you know, where they get really firm and not necessarily dried out, but they just get very, very slick and it's really, really quick. It's, it's speedy, like to the point where, you know, if it's downhill, down grain, downwind, it's, it's almost pretty tough to stop. Yeah. Well, the, the, the greens at Augusta, I mean, that's, they couldn't get them super speedy, um, on Thursday and Friday because of how windy it was the year that I played, um, and then on Saturday they became there, they, they began to get a little bit quicker. And then on Sunday they, they were kind of that speed. Um, the Sunday before they were also that speed. They were, they were super quick. Um, you know, I, I, I don't know what I would, what I would rank them as, but I mean, they were, I wouldn't say by far the fastest greens I've ever put it on, but you know, I'm not going to say you can only make a green so fast, but it was, it was as quick as, as I'd ever seen. Um, you know, the Walker cup last year was, was kind of on that level as well, but, um, they were super quick. So Mm -hmm. as, as far as, uh, preparation on that front under the gun, I was probably going to putt a lot from around the greens. So I I did a lot of longer speed drills, but I don't really think I'd changed a ton. You know, I, um, you mentioned putting. So, uh, you know, you, you use a long putter, uh, non anchored, of course. Um, I use a long putter as well, which is why we're getting along so well, clearly. Um, are you on Broomstick Nation too? I, uh, oh, I didn't realize. Oh, there's, there's a phrase. There's, there's that... Broomstick. Yeah. Yeah. My, one of my buddies in New York, he's, he's a big fan of Broomstick Nation. Okay. So, yeah. It's like, it's like, it's like Strab Nation, but it's, you know, it's, it's even, cooler i uh well i i will share a a personal story so my uh my four ball partner down here in south florida uh dan eggertson he is actually at the uh, the 2016 u.s mid-am as well he is a proud owner of of a commemorative milk jug uh i don't know what's in his but you know i got tired of playing with him and having him be the guy making eight birdies around and i'm the one that you know contributes a handful of pars and maybe a birdie here and there and just you know i was the b player still am but (laughs) finally i was like dude do you got any one any more of those long putters he's like "Yeah, yeah yeah so we literally meet up at a um at a Florida turnpike rest stop because he's about 30 miles or 20 miles north of me or something like that. And, you know, it it, it (laughs) looked like a kind of a very odd, like handoff, you know, not kind of like a drug deal gone weird because he just gets out of the car, opens the back seat. There's nine of them laying in the back seat. And I'm like, like super sketchy, but yeah, not at all. Not at all. Yeah. Just two dorks getting together to trade golf equipment. And I'm there in the parking lot. Yeah. I'm in the parking lot. This one, no, too short. No, no, wait, Okay, yeah, this is a good one. And so now I'm rolling Amazing. with that. But but he actually um has tons of them. He has the camera and he has he has tons of them. Now, how did you uh how did you make that change? What prompted your change to go to a long putter or have you been broomstick nation since birth? <laughs> uh the wand? No. Okay, so I putted so poorly one year at Pac 12s. I think it was like after my sophomore year and I was just like we've got to make a change. Like we've got to do something. Cause it was becoming like not fun. Right. And it was just like, like, I don't like the Y word, but it was just like, I was putting so badly that like at a certain point, like I always considered myself a pretty darn good putter. And then like, as soon as you start missing, like confidence was dropping and it was just like, 
it wasn't enjoyable, right? Sure. Like you should be walking to the green and be like thrilled about the opportunity to make a putt, no matter the length, yeah. right? So I was basically like when I picked it up, I you know, it, like the motor skills are totally different and you basically like give yourself like a new opportunity to relearn how to putt. So what I told myself was like three things. And I, and I really think that this is really all putting comes down to one. You got to have, I mean, okay. Besides the fact you got to be a good green area reader, but we'll leave that out of it. Um, you got to have really good speed. If you're going to misread a putt by, you know, a foot, but have great speed while well, you're a foot away, if you, you know, misread a putt by an inch, two inches, and you, you know, you, you're four feet off. Well, you know, then you could have four, you know, you, you, you go, I'm trying to say, right. Yeah, absolutely. So that's, so that's one, <clears throat> two, you gotta, you know, hit your line. So, you know, I basically just, I put down a chalk drill and I just went to town, you know, I, I did it so many times until it became muscle memory and it just, it became normal. And then thirdly, and in my opinion, most importantly was no matter what your method is that you use, you really got to believe in it. You genuinely have to believe you're the best putter in the world. Like anyone, like, like if you, if you miss, well, it's not your fault. Like, you know, it hit a, hit an imperfection in the green right. or, you know, you misread it. Like you hit it, like you hit a great putt. Like you have to believe you're the best putter in the world. And that's like, I am 100% convinced that there are some guys on tour that literally play out there because they believe that they're the best player in the world. And you have to have that. Of course. And, um, so that's, yeah, that's kind of how I, how I got it. I've been doing it for about four or five months, I guess. And a lot of my off season will be working on that thing. And just put it. So like my suggestion would be like speed is one thing and you can do your various speed drills. Um, but when you, when you get your golf balls, right, like get one of those, like line them up things yeah, and yeah. like put a line on the ball, get a chalk line, find a straight putt, you know, preferably like uphill or flat, put a chalk line down and it's tedious and annoying, but like it works, like go and line up, the, your ball like go through your full routine line up the ball and hit no exaggeration hundreds of putts like if that means you know you grab three balls and you hit them five times and you go 15 like do it at the beginning the end whatever like that's how that thing's going to get ingrained the quickest and just make that line be as tight as can be one of the drills that i uh, stole from from my buddy dan Egertson is uh, a a yardstick with the little holes at the end of them for like hanging on a hook and the ball sits right on that little hole and you need to get the ball rolling on top of that yardstick to the cup yeah perfect yeah, yeah. same same idea i like the chalk line but same concept yeah yeah. Well, yeah. interesting. Yeah. Broomstick nation did not know that that will be a hashtag <laughs> and that'll be a hashtag on our, on our social media post. Um, we got to get shirts. We got to get shirts printed up the whole nine yards. So what we're going to so down, <laughs> all right, we're going to get that done. Um, Amazing. so uh, your master's experience, I did a little bit of digging, you know, you get in, I, I will just assume that the drive down Magnolia was epic. We can kind of move on past that. <laughs> um, but you know, your, your experience there just from other interviews that you've done, I mean, you shared a little bit about your experience where, you know, you're, you're having, you know, you're having lunch with, with Phil Mickelson and you're playing nine with, uh, with Condoleezza Rice and your practice rounds are with, uh, you know, um, you know, Jordan Spieth and, and you're, you're getting a putting, you know, lesson from Ben Crenshaw. I mean, this is just, you know, forget about the tournament. That just sounds like a pretty full experience right there. Um, can you share any story that maybe like, like, tell me about one of those experiences and just anything you talked about with Phil or playing with Condoleezza Rice, you know, anything you can share about just some of the things that people didn't see. They saw your play. They saw you made the cut. What about something that maybe someone didn't see? I've got a good one that actually wasn't, that wasn't that week. Perfect. It was, it was in a practice round leading up to it. This one's, this one's, this one's really good. Um, okay. okay. So, so when I would go down there, well, I wasn't, I was I wasn't there, Stu. It can't be that good. Okay. But you go ahead. <laughs> yeah, fair. Um, I'll, I'll see if I can, I'm sure I can. I'll, I'll think of one from that week, but, uh, no, this, this one, this one, this one's good. So, um, I, we would make trips or I would, you know, I, I, I went down there, you know, for a couple of days and, um, I, I was, I was with, you know, a, a, a caddy named John Chance, who's who's down there, who was a great guy and helped me tremendously for that week. Um, and we would work together, um, you know, kind of leading up to the event. So we're probably in, I don't know, early March, we'll call it. And um, what I would do is I would, I would, you know, wake up early. I'd go 
I'd hit balls and practice for like an hour and a half. Um, I'd get there at eight, which I, I or seven forty five, eight o'clock, which is I think kind of when they would let me come out. And um, you know, I'd 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 hit balls and practice and let it warm up a little bit because you know it would played a little bit differently during that week than than um, you know than how it would play kind of in, in early in early March. It was just a little colder and a little sure. you know damper and so on. So then I would play from kind of the front of the back tee box to try and make it as similar as possible to what the week would look like. So I would, I would play 18 in the morning, um, you know, probably till about two more or less, I would go through my work and, you know, go through the different hole positions and different scenarios and shots and this and that. And then after that, I would, I would go and have lunch, you know, I'd have a, I would have a quick lunch kind of by myself and, you know, then I would go out and practice. And, um, and then in the afternoon, what I typically would do, um, and anyone that's, that's ever had the, the opportunity to go to Augusta National, it's, it's very undulating. It's very hilly, um, you know, much, much more so than, you know, it gets credit for on, on TV. So it's, it's a pretty, I don't want to say exhausting walk, but like it's, you know, if you kind of go through the measurements of, <clears throat> um, you know, just playing a practice round where you're putting to different holes and hitting shots and it, like it's what I really wanted to do. And this is like a side change to where I'm going with this. This is not part of the story. It's more just like, it just gives color to yeah, Augusta. Absolutely. But, but you know, like I really wanted to maximize and make my time there as efficient as possible, like to simulate what it was like playing that week. And, um, you know, so I would play nine and I, I would, I would, like I said, play 18, have lunch practice, and then I would go play nine, but I would just play one ball and just, you know, play for a score more or less more than anything else. Just really enjoy the opportunity to, to play Augusta national because that in and of itself is, is pretty special. Yep. So I go and have lunch and in there, as you know, I went to USC and this, this, this older gentleman walks in, he's wearing a cashmere sweater and he he's kind of hunched over. And I, I, I know immediately who it is. I go over to him and I say, gosh, you know, I just, you know, I had to come over and introduce myself. Coach Holtz. My name is Stuart Hagestad. You know, I went to USC, but I've had, the, I mean, I have the opportunity to play in the masters in April. And I just want to say, it's such an honor to meet you. And he kind of says, Oh, you know, Stuart, that's great. And, you know, I, I'll, I'll, I'll pray for you. And which by the way, is like the coolest thing ever to have yeah. Coach Holt say that yeah. he'll pray for you, you know? And I was like, Oh, you know, great. So I, I and I, you know, like, I, I still think anything that goes on at Augusta national is, is like the coolest thing in the world. But I go out to the range and I see my, see my caddy and, you know, I have the chance to hit balls on the, on the practice range. And, you know, I start my practice routine and um, I think I put on like George Strait or I, I well, was George Strait and, you know, just on my phone, you know, lightly playing music. And you know, I was at practice and kind of hit balls and my, and John looks at me, he's like, Oh, you know, I, I told John the story about, you know, coach Holtz and what he said and put on George Strait. And he goes, Oh, you know, the story about George Strait and coach Holtz. I'm like, no. And he goes, yeah, well, I guess one day George Strait was out here playing with the member and, you know, he saw coach Holtz and he kind of did the same thing as you did. And, um, you know, he, he kind of goes over to him and says hi and introduces himself. And I guess they start talking for a couple seconds. And and Lou goes, so George, tell me, what do you do? <laughs> George is like, well, 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 sir, I'm a I'm a country music artist. And I guess I guess Coach Holtz goes, oh, that's wonderful. You got any good ones? And George is like, uh, yeah, done OK. Yes, sir. And I guess the member, whoever George is with, kind of like had to like patiently explain to, to Coach Holtz, you know, who, you know, what he had done. And yeah, um, it, was, it was pretty funny. That's awesome. Yeah. Only only at Augusta National, right? Uh, it's it's wild. I don't know what what other things happened that week. Um, we I didn't. Uh, that was the year that the weather, uh, you know, canceled the par three contest. So yeah, that had, to see that, my, that had to be a bummer with that. Yeah, you know, as devastated as dad was, hopefully I made it up to him that week. But um, yeah, yeah, you did. You did. OK, <laughs> um, I asked this question to your buddy, Matt Parziali, who uh, who won the U.S. Mid uh, the year after you did. You did stay in the crow's nest, I know, for one night. That's kind of the mm-hmm. rite of passage for amateurs. I asked him this question and he, he immediately kind of went into panic mode. And then he's like, wow, that's a really good idea. But you're there for a night. You're looking you're around all this history. Now, I know that you wouldn't do this. And I said this to Parziali. I know that you didn't do this. But if you're a degenerate like me and you've stayed in many, many hotels, um, traveling around, playing in golf tournaments, you know, it's natural. You, you, you steal, you know. A, a pad from from the table. You steal a towel. You take some of the shampoos. We, you know, everyone does it. It's no big deal. When you're staying at the crow's nest, did you see anything there that you're like, 
man, this would look really nice in my office with that milk jug I want at Stonewall. I mean, <laughs> did, did anything look appealing? Not that you would, because that's, I mean, that's really kind of bad karma to lift something from the crow's nest. But did anything look interesting enough that it crossed your mind for a second? I mean, I had a cocktail the night before in, a, in an Augusta National plastic cup. I think I may have took that. Took oh, that shit. Away. Everyone's got those. <laughs> I got seven of those in my kitchen, man. I'm talking about something out of the crow's nest. I mean, come on. No, nothing in the crow's nest, but I I did take home a, a pretty good piece of hardware that week that's that's in the other room. So there you know, you I, I turned I turned out okay. So you you got to play a practice round with with Jordan Spieth. Now this is not something where you or where you called them up and and you know you play with JT, you play with Jordan Spieth. This isn't something that you called him up and say hi, I'm Stuart Agustin. You know these guys from junior golf. Uh, yeah, he got he got to play one with me. That see now I gotta <laughs> I gotta rephrase that so they were lucky enough to join you the 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 elder statesman of the group, um, I That's ran right. I ran across a tremendous photo from a Texas Junior Golf Tournament that I'm going to send to you, um, it's you and 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 Spieth and man are you rocking a haircut holy cow. Um, but, yeah, do you see what do you see what do you see what place of what flags we are holding? I d- yes, because I think Spieth is fifth and you're fourth, so uh, we'll make you sure. Wanna, you want to you want to know you want to know the part of that that you probably didn't know? Uh, sure, we like stories here. Go ahead. For some reason, they made us play off for fourth place. Oh dear God, really? So so they already decide who won it. I'm looking at I'm looking at the trophy right now. They made us play off for some strange reason for fourth place. By the way, I will never let Jordan hear the end of this, um, it, I, except it's not like he cares. I'm like the oh, fuselage that oh. flew off of his career. Yeah, I was um, <laughs> yeah no, it's like he, cool story still. Yeah. Um, no, OK, so so, um, you know, I finish and whatever and, you know, they we get in and, and they're like, so we're going to have you play off for fourth place. And I'm like, oh, it's kind of weird, but whatever. Who am I playing? And they're like, there's this kid out of Dallas. Supposedly he's a pretty good putter. He's really young, but he's really good. And we think he's going to be, you know, pretty good at golf. And I'm like, okay, whatever. So we go out and I introduce myself and this and that. And I end up, the short story is I end up making just an outrageous up and down on the first hole. And I think he missed about an eight footer for par, which is like the last putt inside 10 feet he's missed since then. Sure. Um, Right. But uh, yeah. So um, how about that? I, I, I clipped him. I mean, that's, uh, I mean, other than that whole U.S. mid am Walker Cup making the cut of the Masters, I think that's what I would hang my hat on in life. I mean, that's, that's where I would, that's where I would be at that. So, um, so, but, but yeah, so, t- but so. tell me about the, yeah, tell me about the practice round and just like, you know, you've, you've played junior golf with these guys, they turn pro, they do their thing. You're staying amateur, you're doing your thing. And then you guys converge again at Mecca and like, so we go off and I had gone back and forth with Jordan and Justin because of the weather that week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday was a little thrown off. Um, sure. If you recall, there was just a massive storm in the area and it canceled a bunch of flights and <clears throat> it just, it was, it, it, you know, it was, it wasn't great, but um, I, what I decided to do was I didn't play on Monday. I just practiced all day. Um, the last thing I wanted to have happen was basically to be left out on the golf course, you know, as a storm blew through and then it kind of throws your rhythm off and, um, so anyways, so, um, I played nine on Tuesday and then I played nine on, or well, what ended up being eight on, on, uh, on Wednesday, you know, before the, the what was supposed to be the, the part three competition. Yeah. So jo- Justin couldn't play. I think he was just practicing that day. Um, again, the storm was supposed to blow through around like one. Um, so I went out and played nine with Jordan and we're on the range and we, uh, we were going to go out and, and play with Kuchar. Kuchar was going to join us. Oh, that guy. Yeah. So we get to the first tee and to be very clear, like I'm, I'm still kind of terrified of, you know, just like the whole situation. Like I was very nervous that week and, um, you know, just, you know, playing in front of that many people and, sure. you know, in, in my eyes, just the, the mecca of, of, you know, competitive golf. And so Jordan or they, they're like, okay, let's have a bet, you know, let's play for something. Um, I'm like, all right, whatever, you know, I, it sure. was like, what, whatever you want to do, money bags, you set the price. Sure. Yeah. I was like, sure. You know, I, I don't know. It was like five bucks or something, but I don't gamble. So I, I wasn't a part of that because I'm, I'm an amateur. Right. Um, gotcha. right. Um, so we're on the first tee and Jordan looks over and he's like, Hey, don't be intimidated. He's not a nice guy. I'm like, okay. Like kind of weird, but whatever. Um, so Jordan Birdie's the first, I probably didn't finish the hole. Um, Matt, I think birdie's the second, 
Jordan Birdie's the third. I think we pushed the fourth. I actually think I contributed with a par. And then Matt Birdie's the fifth. So I'm there and it's like, you know, you're, it's like you're hanging out with your brothers and sister all over again. Right. No, no, yeah, exactly, exactly. So we get to the six T and Matt's like, okay, let's do a quick recap. Jordan, you won one, I won two. Jordan, you won three, we pushed four, I won five. I've got three. Jordan, you've got two. Stu, how many, how, how many do you have? I'm like, all right, man. I'm just. What an ass. Just, yeah. <laughs> so I was, I was just like, all right, all right man. Like, I, I get it. I, I need to get better. Yeah. That's, uh, that's, that sounds like, uh, are there, you know how many stories like that about Kuchar there are out there floating around? I mean, that's, that's, <laughs> that's got to be tons of them. I've actually, I've had the chance to, to talk with him a couple of times since then. And he's a, he's a really, really nice guy, but he's just, he's a, he's a killer. He's yeah. a secret killer. Yeah. When I was doing the research for, for this episode and, and I've listened to, uh, um, you know, other, you've, you've done other interviews. I've, I've done a lot of reading and, and I just remember watching after, you know, you win, you win the silver, you, you win low AM, you make the cut and the onslaught of questions that you were asked you know, hey, you're going to turn pro, right? Well, why aren't you turning pro? And I just kept thinking to myself, damn, just leave this guy alone. Let him enjoy what he just accomplished. It's just a <laughs> such a massive thing that he just did. So that was my first reaction. And then I started thinking about, well, wait a minute, this guy works in, in finance. He's in New York. And the amount of money that these kids have to spend to chase this dream of playing uh, playing professionally on the PGA Tour is just astronomical. And not all the pros out there on tour are traveling like, you know, JT and Jordan, all the other big, big stars. <laughs> and, you know, if you're doing it right and you're playing all the time, you know, you, you, you can't work. You got to do the mini tours. And then you have that small window of Q school to get through. And, oh, you didn't get through? All right, now you got to start all over again, do it for another year. And I'm thinking all the connections you've made, all the people that you've met through the amateur game, why would you turn pro? You're going to make so much more of your career and, and your enjoyment of golf without going down that road. So is that, I mean, not to put words in your mouth, but is, is that kind of what you're thinking of? And, and is that when people ask that question of, aren't you going to turn pro is, do you kind of look at it that way? What I will say is I just don't think the world of, of professional golf is quite as glamorized as, you know, the PGA tour media or, golf way or whatever like i just don't think it's as glamorized as as um as you know your kind of typical you know weekend watcher of the pga tour thinks it is right um you know mini tours and you know smaller kind of satellite events are littered with former you know all americans and you know some walker cuppers and alleged can't miss kids and I just, I don't really think it's quite as, uh, you know, as, as you kind of mentioned as, as glamorized or as, uh, you know, as, as perfect as, as people think it is. And at the same time, you know, I just, as much fun as, as competitive golf is and don't get me wrong. Like I love it. You know, I, I've got my own personal goals and, you know, definitely, you know, want to try and compete at, at a high level for a long time, um, in some capacity, but as I kind of, you know, project and look out on my life and, you know, 30, 35, 40 years, there's a lot more than, than just playing. And for me personally, I, I've kind of found that, you know, playing a stretch of competitive golf as I've been fortunate enough to do for a couple summers since winning the mid, you know, chasing personal goals of mine, I've found that it, it's, to me, it's made me a little one dimensional. Um, I get focused, um, you know, kind of on golf and I would rather kind of spread, spread myself, you know, a little bit deeper and, um, one thing that I'm, I'm really committed to is I have had the chance, you know, as I've grown up to have two amazing parents and I don't know that, you know, playing professionally gives myself the best opportunity to be the best, you know, husband and father, you know, that I maybe could be for my kids and, you know, to support them and, um, you know, the, the community that, you know, I've been fortunate enough to, to be raised in and friends. And, and then besides that, um, and this is something I've, I've kind of thought a long, a long time about, but, when you look at the world of, you know, either professional golf or really just, you know, historically, you know, over the last hundred years, you know, let's talk about the people that have really made a significant impact on, you know, the world much more than just themselves. Sure. You know, you get Bobby Jones and Tiger and Jack and Arnold and, you know, certainly you could, you can find, you know, a few more, um, you know, but you look at guys in the world of, of amateur golf and maybe not to the extent, you know, of the, 
the success that I've been fortunate enough to have, you know, in the last, you know, couple of years, but you know, you look at guys, you know, I've had the chance to meet, like I, you know, guys I look up to, um, you know, like Seth Waugh, who just became, you know, was president of the PGA of America, or, you know, Jimmy Dunn or, um, you know, shoot, uh, you know, the captain I played for, for the Walker cup, you know, Spider Miller, um, you know, these are guys, you know, that I've had the chance to meet and spend a little bit of time around. And I think that, that those have kind of replaced a lot of the, the idols that I had, you know, when I was younger of professional athletes, right. Because they've had that, you know, that chance to be fathers and parents and, and leaders, um, you know, and much more than just the golf course. So that's, that's, that's kind of my thinking there. Yeah, no, it makes uh, that makes perfect sense. Uh, before I let you go, I definitely want to talk about the Walker cup. You were the only mid am on that Walker cup cup team in 2017 held at your home course of LA country club. Um, so probably a little early compare that 2017 team against the, the 20, uh, 2007 team that had, you know, Dustin and, and Ricky and, and the rest of the crew. But I'm looking at this roster that you had up, up there in 2017, as you said, you played for, for spider Miller, but a lot of these names, a lot of people are going to know who they are if they don't know them already, but you got, you know, Cameron champ who just, who just won and, you know, McNeely and Colin Morikawa, doc Redmond, Scheffler, you got all these great names. Um, probably, uh, did you feel that it was a little more special to make it as a mid am than if you did, if you were at these other kids age, you know, that 19, 20, 21, you know, I, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, I think I was in a lot different place than a lot of these kids coming out of school. You know, my, my second semester, my senior year, I was, I was a little bit more involved in, you know, where I was going to work after college and, you know, drinking as much beer as I could on yes. Thursday nights. Um, yes. Zambri will make, you know, my old coach at SC will make fun of me just as much, but I don't, I don't know that I practiced in the spring, my senior fall on, on Fridays. Coach knew I wasn't turning pro and I felt like I had kind of solidified my place in the lineup. You know, it, I, I, I was very comfortable being the backup QB on a, on a, you know, on a pretty good, you know, on an okay team. And, there you, go. you know, I got my work done on Friday afternoons. And so I, I think that from a maturity standpoint and from a, you know, goal selection standpoint, had my goals been what they, you know, were now, um, you know, when I was 21, 22, I, I think I may give you a little different answer, but I, I don't necessarily think of myself with no due respect whatsoever to, to any mid ams out there, but, you know, I like to think that my body's in pretty good shape and, you know, I've, I, I've made a, a tremendous amount of sacrifices, you know, since school, whether it's, you know, socially or whatever, you know, to accomplish some of those goals. And it was pretty special, um, you know, to play in front of home, you know, friends and family, at LA country club where I'm, I'm fortunate enough to, to spend a little bit of time. Um, it, it was almost, and I think you saw it, you know, the first day, as far as, as far as, you know, how I played, it was almost the uh, sense of home course disadvantage where I, I felt like I put a lot of pressure on myself right, to, to right. play well. Um, but yeah, I, you know, the Walker cup is so special in, in my, in my eyes, you know, individual accomplishments are, are very cool. You know, they're very, they mean a, you know, the world to me, as far as the mid am and the masters and the U S open. Um, but as far as a team atmosphere goes and representing your country, it's just so much bigger than, than anything else. And I'm, I'm a firm believer that if you're fortunate enough to play on the Walker cup, well, you were, you were chosen to represent, you know, obviously you're chosen based on your, on your play and your, you know, your character and, you know, what you've, what you've kind of, you know, proven you know as a person and as a player over the past two years but but just as much you know you're you're chosen to represent you know a team and your captain in the united states and every previous walker cupper before you so if that means that you play four matches then great if that means you play one that's great too sure you know at the end of the day like you're representing something that's so much bigger than yourself and um i whether i was 21 or 26 i guess i was um it was, it was pretty special and it was, um, you know, I, I, I can't even begin to kind of put into words, you know, just how much the event and, and anyone that's had the chance to, to have played in a Walker cup, you know, what that bond and just what those memories mean to me. So that no, yeah. was pretty cool. Now, not, not to, um, discount anyone on that team. You have just massive names, you know, McNeely and, 
and Doc Redman, who was the reigning U.S. Amateur Champion. But throughout the practice sessions, was there anyone that just kind of jumped out at you? That just yeah okay yeah no I um listen everyone's yeah they're all they're play. all they're all they're all gonna yeah I, I'm not asking you to pick one over yeah, the other yeah. but listen I I we can everyone's a stud and this doesn't take away from anything but, right um and when I've answered this question before people have said you're insane how is that not Norman Nor Norman's a complete stud and right um you know obviously what Cam's done you know recently is pretty wild but to me. When I watched Colin Morikawa that week, I was like, how do you ever shoot above 67? Like, <laughs> you hit it 310, and it falls a yard and a half left or right, dead straight. Like, like we're not, I mean, we're not talking like, you know, like pretty straight. Like, we're talking center line every time. He hits 14 or 15 greens. He gets up and down three or four times. He hits three out of four par fives. And if it doesn't go in on the greens from 20 feet, it scares the hole and it's a tap in. We were together at the practice session um, the December before as well. And I left the practice session and I was just like, you need to get a lot better. And like, that was just kind of okay. reamplified, you know, at, at the Walker, like leading into that event, it was just like, how do you, how does anyone on this team, you know, not make it? Like, I just, yeah. Well, I would, I mean, just by hearing you talk about being on the Walker Cup team, I mean, when people ask you that question all the time of, well, why aren't you turning pro? I mean, I would imagine that was just, hey, you want to know why? Go go watch these kids. Go go watch yeah, these like guys. Cameron, like Cameron Champ, it's at 50 by me. And I'm Not, longer than, right. and I'm longer than the tour average. And, you know, Doug Gim never seeing the golf course, which is essentially a U.S. Open golf course, you know, at LA country club goes out and shoots bogey free 65. Like it's, it's, it's fascinating how good the kids are. And it's almost like, like they don't know how good they are. It's, it's like almost like natural and normal. And it's just, it's, uh, it's wild, man. I, 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 I think that team's going to do a lot of really special things. Yeah. So, yeah. so, so real quick. So sure. I, uh, after, after cam one, I, I sent spider a text, um, you know, something along the lines of like, you know, how cool is this? You know, stoked for Cam. Only 38 behind Buddy. You know, who was the captain of that of that team in 07 or something like that. And Spider sends back, yeah, pretty cool. Except Buddy's only 42 behind Downing. And I and I thought about it for a minute and I was like, oh, right. Downing had that guy Tiger, didn't he? All right, Stu, I understand that reference. Why don't you explain it for the listeners? So Cam got his first wins. So that's the first PGA Tour win for Spider. So I put Buddy as like the next guy, um, you know, because he was captain of that 07 team that, you know, has gotten you know, right. so much credit for the team. But Downing Gray was 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 Tiger's Walker Cup captain. I think it was Downing 95, Spider, right? That was 95, right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And Downing and Spider, really, really close. They're like best friends. <laughs> wow, that's interesting. So the Walker Cup captains keep a little score on how their teams did. And how, oh, that's that's pretty good. So pretty uh, funny. Yeah. Um, we, so I have always asked, uh, similar questions at most of the, uh, ending of the episodes. It's just a quick bucket at the back of the range. So I'll ask you a handful of these and see if I can get your take on a few of these. Um, so if you could give a major championship to anyone in history, whether they're alive or dead, whether they have one major, no majors, 18 majors, you can give a major championship to anyone in history and it can't, yeah. be, can't be yourself. So who beat who, me to it? I know. Well, I, I've this, you know, I've been doing this, this podcast for a while and everyone tries to sneak that in. So you can't give it to yourself. Who would you give a major championship to? Probably my dad. So we can play in the father, son. Nice. There you go. Yeah. 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 Probably my dad. So I can, we can play in the father, son and I can, I can hear stories in the back of the range from, from legends of the game. There you go. I mean, you should get into marketing. You're doing a hell of a job with this <laughs> podcast. Uh, let's see. Uh, to, uh, Jack's win, uh, speaking of father, son. Uh, so Jack's win at the masters in 86, compare that to a fifth green jacket of tiger woods, which would be the more substantial victory. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of a product of growing up in a tiger era. Sure. So, so I'm probably going to get some backlash from this, but with tiger and everything he's done, um, I mean, I can confidently say I probably wouldn't be playing if it wasn't for him and, you know, what he's done in the game. And, you know, really, you know, I'm kind of in that in that age bracket, you know, where everyone within a 
a few years. Absolutely. Um, you know, of my age, you know, can probably say the same, but I think just in light of, you know, recent events, I think it would be, um, similar, but different, but you know, what Jack did it, whatever he was 46, I think it was, and the stories that came with it and the, the color commentators, you know, Vern Lundquist and, you know, I obviously Jim Nance, you know, at, a, at Augusta national is, is kind of that new voice, but, um, just the, the picture that was painted, you know, of, of Jack, um, in 86 is, is tough to beat, but, um, you know, I'd be lying to you if I, if I told you I, I wasn't rooting for, you know, tiger of the field in, in April. Um, I, it'd be more than anything else. If, if, if tiger were to win, I feel like a lot of kids, you know, that are younger didn't really get to understand or appreciate just how great he was at his best. And 100%. it's not really what's, it's not really even an argument, you know, of, of if he's good for the game and he doesn't move the needle. He is the needle, you know, the amount of excitement and enjoyment when he won at Eastlake is, is any, is unlike anything we've ever seen. Yeah. And you kind of got a taste of that at the British open and um, you know, with the PGA championship, but I just think it would be so great for the game and it would produce so many more eyeballs, you know, if he were to not only be in contention, but to pull it off, I think it'd be um, a pretty, you know, generational and, and transcendent win. I keep thinking back um, to that win at East Lake, and I thought, how perfect is this? And it would not have been the same if he would have won the Valspar. Mm-hmm. It wouldn't have been the same. I mean, if you went, if he would have won the British, that would have been been amazing. But it, it was perfect. I mean, it would not have been the same if he would have won Valspar. Uh, I know he was in contention at a handful of other ones. Um, I, you know, I think he, he had a couple top tens that weren't, you know, really, really close to the lead, but that one at Valspar, but yeah. And, and that's one thing that I keep coming back to, um, how special that victory was. And yeah, un, unreal, uh, crowd reaction. I mean, that was, that was, I mean, so we, we, I was playing, it was the second round of the mid am this year and I, I didn't literally sprint, but like after it became, in my mind, like I knew I was going to make the cut. I think I was on like the 13th or 14th hole. I literally asked my dad, um, you know, I was like, Hey, or like people that were following the group. I was like, can any, can someone check on tiger? Like, I just, yeah, I want to know what he got. That, like, that, that says, yeah. That says it right there. Um, uh, you mentioned, you mentioned us mid. I forgot to ask you about this thing. Um, now that, you know, you're, you're at pretty much the U S mid when you show up, everyone knows who you are, your former champion, uh, does, does the U S mid feel different for you now, as far as eyes on you, you're got a, maybe a target on your back, maybe similar to probably what Nathan Smith, uh, maybe thinks, is there any kind of a difference, uh, when you're playing in that event now? You know, I, I I'm not going to pretend it's, <clears throat> it's not different to have, you know, yourself be, you know, in either like a poster that's there or, yeah. or a media guide. I mean, I try and treat it like any other event, you know, for me, it's, I'm not going to say it's my super bowl, but you know, it's there's certain events during the year that I put a, not a tremendous amount of pressure on myself, but like they're, they're amplified. So, you know, that week, like, you know, the, the, the effort and, you know, attention that I put into it, like that's one of the weeks that you're really trying to peak for. Um, as far as attention from other guys, I don't know, man. I, I think that's maybe given me more credit than I deserve. I, I still look at, at Nathan and, and McCoy and Harv and, you know, even Parzi Alley. And I, I look at those guys and, you know, they're, they're just as accomplished and, you know, what they've, what they've done with the game. And, um, you know, I'm just, I'm just lucky to kind of be a part of that group. Sure. And you got to play with a lot of those guys at concession cup. Um, yeah, I mean, you're in that circle now where you're playing with the elite uh, mid ams and senior ams in, in the country. Um, you know, I'm an amateur golfer. There's a lot of us that are amateurs that are, that are, a lot of amateurs are listening, but you guys are just at that that different level playing in events like the Coleman and the Thomas, you know, the Crump Cup. I mean, it's just it's just a different category, and you get to sit and talk to these guys that have been that are kind of where you want to be in the next 15, 20 years with all these different experiences. Has totally. have, you, have you made a connection with it, maybe anyone in particular and really kind of picked their brain? Like, okay, how do you how do you balance you know, the, the wife and the kids and the job and all that stuff. I mean, I know you don't have all that on your plate quite yet, but have you made a connection with maybe anyone in particular that that's maybe kind of a mentor in the small little circle that you guys are in? No, I mean, I think you just hit the nail on the head. I mean, while I, I don't have a lot of that yet, you know, that, that day's coming and, you know, that's a, that's a big part of, you know, 
who I am and who I would like to be in the future. And it's a balancing act. Um, I've, I've gotten pretty close. Um, so that week during the concession cup, I, I had the opportunity to play with Michael McDermott, who is one of the guys, um, you know, in kind of the, the regional level of, of really high level, um, amateur and mid amateur golf. And one of the things that Mike and I have, have talked about a lot, um, Mike started a, a company, um, I think it's called Kathmere Financial or Kathmere Investments, but you know he's got he's got um, you know a few boys at home, and he's a I mean, he's just he's a really highly you know respected guy. He's very involved at the Crump at Pine Valley, and um, he's a heck of a player. I think he qualified for like five or six straight um, you know U.S. amateurs and mid amateurs, and um, he's I as I talked about before, you know he uh, I, I played him you know in the in the quarters of the mid am. Um, and, you know, didn't know a tremendous amount, you know, about him, but I knew he was a pretty darn good player. And, uh, one of the things that we've, you know, talked about is just how, how regimented you have to be and, you know, how you kind of have to, have to set your goals and, you know, wake up early and make sacrifices and, you know, just, you don't have a lot of time and to be the kind of dad and husband and, and, you know, kind of leader, whether it's at your firm or in the community that you want to be, um, you know, there's one thing you, you can't really get more of and that's time and it's just yep. it's it's a lot of, it's a lot of time management and it's a lot of um you know like you said sacrifices but you know a lot of the older guys i mean i've been i've been very lucky um you know buddy and and, and Vinny and um and spider and i'm just i i think the world of you know can all of those guys and um you know what they've been able to do and hopefully when i look back in 30 or 40 years i have a resume that's you know, remotely in the same ballpark as those guys. So they've set the standard pretty high. Absolutely. So uh, you follow us on Instagram. That's kind of how we got connected. We start something that I've just recently started called Would You Rather? And I know that game has been around. Uh, everyone knows what Would You Rather is, but um, we've kind of put a little bit of a golf spin on it. So short answers. Would you rather play a tournament without golf tees or without wedges? Golf tees. No, like without even thinking about it. Okay. Um, would you rather? I'll go. I'll, anyone, anyone that, like, I feel like hitting driver off the deck is now a staple at SC. And I am fully <laughs> convinced that the Slim Reaper started that. Uh, who? The Slim? Oh, oh you? You're the, wait a minute. This is your nickname, the Slim Reaper? No, nah, that's what the assistant coach at SC used to call me. The Slim Reaper. Wow. He's now the, he's now the, he's now the head coach at, uh, or Slender Man. He's, he's, he's now the head coach of the women's team at SC. Oh, okay. Nice. Nice yeah. little shout out. Silver, yeah, Silver, Silverstein. Nice. Um, all right, so you got, so you picked without golf tees. Um, let's see here. For sure. Would you rather, um, would you rather, let's see, would you rather rewrite the ending of Tin Cup so that McAvoy wins the U.S. Open, or would you completely eliminate the existence of Caddyshack 2? Caddyshack 2. Never seen it. Okay, it's terrible. Um, <laughs> it's so bad. Jackie Mason. Um, let that register. Come on, man. I'm, I'm, tw I'm 27. You got to challenge me here. I'm, I'm, I'm in the, I'm in the happy Gilmore camp. Oh dear. Oh, oh okay. All right. Um, <laughs> let's see. Have you ever seen the movie dead solid? Perfect with Randy Quaid? Uh, you got to no, see it. No, it's, so. a good, it's a good golf movie. You got to see it. All right. <laughs> uh, let's see. Would you, now this one's going to be, I don't know if you're going to be able to answer this one fairly, but no, good. would you rather get a free week badge to the masters for you and three friends for the next five consecutive years or would you rather play one round at Augusta National with your one round at Augusta National? Or would you rather? Let me finish, damn it! Or would you <laughs> rather? Or would you rather play one round at Augusta National with three of your ex girlfriends? Mm. Mm. First one. Actually, hold on. <laughs> going through the going through the Rolodex hold of on. ex girlfriends. All right, hold talk. on, hold on. I'm uh, trying to think of what uh, how many bad terms I'm on. That's what I know. That's what I'm getting. Okay, don't talk yeah. to her. Don't talk to her. One of one one of them would. I'd be fine with that. No, 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 no. I'd no. Okay, I'm gonna go with the first one. I'm gonna go with the first one. Okay, so you would rather be a spectator for five years with three of your friends and pass. Okay, okay. So yeah, I, there's there's way more political capital I can get out of that than three ex girlfriends. Brilliant. Okay, always always thinking, always using the business mind. Um, let's. I see. mean, I mean, yeah. Like, come on. No, no. Sure. I, 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 well, it's kind of hard to ask you. You've already played. So, and, and you, and every, and every year 
you're playing in a tournament that could get you back in there. So it's kind of hard to have that be fair for you. That's a, that's a question for for other people that may have not, you know, those. If I do it right, there's two, and if I play in the British Am next year, there's three. So that's very true. That's very true. Let's lock in. <laughs> that's very true. Um, let's see. Um, would you rather win the PGA Championship or play on two losing Ryder Cup teams? Ooh, that one's really good. Um, this is great that I'm getting to test these out on you because these literally, this is kind of what you know boggles around in my brain. I'm like, all right, let's try this. No, no, no. That 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 one's that one's the toughest so far. That one's really good okay. because if you because if you pick the, if you if you pick the PGA one, then you don't look like a team guy. But if you're on the losing Ryder Cup side, it's devastating. Um, gosh. Um, you know what? One thing we said at the at the at the Walker Cup this year yeah. that's a heck of a lot cooler to be on a winning Walker Cup team than it is to just be on a Walker Cup team. Yeah, I'm gonna go with the I'm gonna go with the PGA. See, that's the right answer here because if you win the PGA Championship, that itself is most likely going to get you on a Ryder Cup team anyway. Facts. That's true. Plus, like the first question you're going to get asked after you know 30 years down the line after your after your Ryder Cup is, oh, how'd you guys end up? And when you have to say you lost twice, it's devastating. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let's see. So this one might be interesting for you. I know that that turning professional, we've, we've covered that. But would you rather play the web for three full seasons and then graduate to the PGA Tour? Or would you rather spend two years on mini tours and Monday qualifying and then make it to the PGA Tour? No, web for sure. Okay. Um, let's see. You've, you're, you're played in the mini tour event? Uh, I have a friend that runs the minor league golf tour down here in Stewart, Florida. His name is Scott Turner. I have never played in one of them. I do have a guy that was on the podcast who we've been friends forever. He played mini tours. Uh, so no, I have never, I've never played professional. Yeah. I mean, you, there's a lot of really, really, really good players out there oh, yeah. that you haven't heard of that can shoot nothing any day of the week. Yeah. Um, yeah. web for sure. Yeah. This one might be interesting for you. Um, would you would you rather spend a year caddying for a top thirty PGA Tour pro and never play golf during that year yourself, or would you rather caddy in St Andrews for a year and play golf all the time during your free time? Mm. Mm. This is great. I'm just I'm excited mm. by your pauses. I'm like this question isn't totally worthless. I mean. Can I ask a couple of contingencies? Sure, sure. I'll open the floor to questions. Mr. Hagestad from California, your question, <laughs> sir. At what point in my life am I? Oh, okay. Uh, let's see. Let's go with... Let's go with like 35, 40, something like that. I mean, I'm not going to say... Yeah, I'm not going to say like 65. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah at, I gotta... at, at 35 or 40, I'd probably choose um, being being with a guy on tour okay and the reason is i just i feel like it'd be you know kind of a fun year-long transition where like i'm still playing competitive golf but like it would it would be at a point in my life where i was either making a a transition career-wise or you know hopefully by that point i'll have i'll have done well and have had you know a decent you know bone whatever like something like that if i was younger if I if if I was younger, um, like right out of college, I would probably say being in St. Andrews. Yeah, I just I, I think it'd be kind of a fun, um, just kind of you know year abroad type you know sequester type deal. But the older you get, it that gets really yep. really tough. Yep. No, I I totally get it. I I I kind of agree. I think right now, if I had my choice, I would go do the thing on the PGA Tour, but. Uh, well, Stu, we have uh, covered just a ton of stuff. I feel like we could probably go for a couple hours more, but uh, that might be for, for next time. I really do appreciate you joining us here at the back of the range. I know that you're uh, uh, it's entering the holidays and you got Thanksgiving dinner with uh, your, your overachieving siblings. So I know you got <laughs> that to look forward to, but uh, we'll definitely keep track of you and see how things go for, uh, for next year. And again, thanks for joining me here at the back of the range. Oh, uh, thanks, man. It's been a blast. Happy to do it anytime. And there you have it, another great episode here at the Back of the Range. Special thanks to Stuart Hagestad for joining us this week and closing out Season 1. We're going to take the week off. We'll be back on January 3rd, 2019, our first anniversary, for the first episode of Season 2 here at the Back of the Range. <laughs>